Section 2.4 Addition of a System of Coplanar Forces When a force is resolved into good components along the x and y axes, the components are then called rectangular components. For analytical work, we can represent these components in one of two ways, using either scalar or Cartesian vector notation. In scalar notation, the rectangular component of force F is shown in 215A. These are found using the parallelogram law, so that the force F is equal to its component forces F sub X and F sub Y. Because these components form a right triangle, they can be determined from our trigonomic laws F of X is equal to F times the cosine of theta, and F of Y is equal to F times the sine of theta, where theta is the angle for the operation of the resultant force F. Each component of the vector is shown as a magnitude and a direction along the y-axis called the j-component and along the x-axis called the i-component. We use these unit vectors, i and j vectors, to designate the x and y components respectively f of in the i direction and the force in the y direction which will be in the the j component of the forces. Since the magnitude of each component of f is always a positive quantity which is represented by the positive scalars f of sub x and f sub y, we can express f as a Cartesian vector where f is equal to the force in the x direction which is the i component plus the force in the y direction, which is the j component. The x and y axis we will orient so they are always perpendicular to each other. Therefore, we can use the law of triangles and our trigonomic laws to define the different components. In this example, we have two forces acting on a point force 1 of 200 newtons at an angle of 30 degrees from the y-axis and force 2 with a magnitude of 260 newtons and its forces are broken down into the right-hand triangle method where its hypotenuse is 13, its run along the x-axis is 12, and its rise along the y-axis is 5. From that information, we can break these forces, F1 and F2, down into their component parts. If we examine force 1 first, the 200 newtons, the force 1 along the y-axis is going to be the force, the resultant force 200 newtons, multiplied by the cosine of 30 degrees. And that's also going to be a force in newtons, so we include the units. And the force along the x-axis is equal to the resultant force of 200 newtons multiplied by the sine of 30 degrees. This allows us to have components in the i and j orientations. For force 2 of 260 newtons, we have a force along the x-axis of 260 newtons, and that's going to be multiplied by the ratio of the run, 12, compared to the hypotenuse 13. So the x component is going to be 12 thirteenths of 260. The y component will be 5 thirteenths of the resultant component, or 260. And there will be some tutorials following this lecture, which goes through a numeric example of this in more detail. We can use either of the two methods just described to determine the resultant of several coplanar forces that all lie in the same plane. To do this, each force is first resolved into its x and y components. Then the respective components are added using scalar algebra, since they are collinear. The resultant force is then formed by adding the resultant components using the parallelogram law. This sounds and looks a little messy, so stay with me here through the theory but we'll go through some examples, and it's not as hard as some of the symbology might make it appear at first glance. So the first step is to do what we've just done. Resolve each of these forces into their component parts. The y component parts 
called the J forces, and the I component parts, or the forces along the X axis. We can see this is done below using the parallelogram theory and the right triangle method in the lower figure. Step two then, we simply add all the X components together and add all the Y components together. The two totals are then the resultant vector and they're the X and Y components of this resultant vector. Once we have find those components, we simply find the magnitude and the angle of the final resultant vector from the information from its component parts. So we start with vectors in different direction, we break them down to their components, we add those components together to find what's called the resultant or the overall force when we look at forces F1, F2, and F3 all combined. So when we break these forces down into their component parts, the resultant force is the sum of each of the forces F1, F2, and F3. In order to add these, however, we need to break them down into their components along the X and Y axis, called the I components and the J components. Again, the symbology here looks a little intimidating, but we'll go through some tutorials that should make it look a little, little simpler when we put numbers in there. So from this, we see that we have the I components, F1 sub X minus F2 sub X, because it's in the negative X direction, plus F3 sub X. Those are all the I components, and they can all be added together to form the X resultant component, F sub R sub X, time in the I direction. That's a little bit of a mouthful. Then we do the exact same thing for the Y component forces. Once we have those, we know that the tangent of theta is equal to the x component, I'm sorry, the y component over the x component. So the inverse tangent is simply gives us the angle theta times the inverse tangent of the y component resultant force over the x component resultant force. And the resultant force itself from our triangle law is equal to the square root of each of the component forces in the x and y direction. There are two examples that follow this on canvas. The first, we have three concurrent forces acting on a tent post, and we'll resolve those forces into their x, y components, add the components, and find the magnitude and angle of the resultant problem. Another example is given for a bent hinge and pin for a bracket. So we have three forces acting on this particular bracket. We'll sketch the different forces on that bracket and resolve them into their X and Y components, add those components together, and find the magnitude and angle. So if you notice, the plan in each of these cases is exactly the same plan for solution. Once you get the hang of it, it's really not that tough. Now notice, here's an actual example that I pulled from the web from a research paper that was published. So how do we apply these forces other than just in the textbook? Well, here's an example that relates to some issues that I have with my knee. Uh, hopefully none of you have had knee issues yet. But if we think about the forces acting on the knee, we see the forces acting on the kneecap are related to the tendons that connect the kneecap to the bones. So we can think about any of these forces and apply these forces to all sorts of biokinetics and kinesiology applications.